Welcome to Book Cuddle. I'm your host, Karen Reader with Read Gab, and I'm really excited about the topic today. We're going to be talking about weaving cultures into literature. And so I've got the amazing Alexandra Alessandri with us today, and she is Colombian. And so two of her books, one just barely came out. And then this one, uh, tell me when Valentina came out. Valentina came out last year. Last year. February right. of last year. So we've got two books and very different. Like we've got realistic fiction on one and very fantasy on the other. So I think this is just going to be so great to talk about culture and two very different topics of literature. So Alexandra, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you just as an individual, not necessarily as an author. What do you love? What? Who are you? Hi, thank you so much, Karen, for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I am a Colombian American author, um, but aside from that, um, I'm a mom. I have an almost senior. He starts band camp on Monday, um, and it's exciting and nerve wracking and a really weird place to be. Um, I'm also, you know, wife, and uh, I was my day job was a teacher and I still do teach um, I taught English uh, composition and literature and creative writing right. through a local college um, and st I still teach as an adjunct um, including some picture book classes um, I love art which if you've read any of my uh, middle grade novels or even um, picked some of my picture books you will maybe pick up on the fact that I love art murals yes. um, that just I love it <laughs> So maybe they're a little bit of reflection of you then the characters you put definitely into it. That's so absolutely. Cool. I yes. love drawing from my own experiences and family and the people, the places that I know. I definitely remember um, Al uh, Valentina, like wanting to draw everything she saw in the um, fantastical world that she was in. Um, I'm trying to remember. Does Lucci is she an artist as well? She is absolutely an artist, and okay. in fact, it's. Her art that allows her oh I remember now because she's <laughs> doing the project okay yes sorry. we'll get into that no, you're fine. Else. <laughs> just when you read so many books they all start to mesh together right 100 all, right. all right so let's start with the first one then we'll go back to um last year you came out is this your debut I didn't realize you're a picture book author Alexandra I yes that is my debut this is my debut for middle grade okay um so this is the debut, and then you previously were doing picture books as well? Correct. Yes. And do you illustrate but your own picture book? I do not. I wish I did. Okay. My, I, no, I, I don't, but um, I've been incredibly happy with the illustrators. Perfect. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we've got The Enchanted Life of Valentina Mejia, and tell us in an elevator pitch of just one to two minutes, let's have the author, Alexandra, you tell us what it's about. So The Enchanted Life of Valentina Mejia is about the siblings, uh, Valentina and her brother Julian, who um, don't quite believe their dad's stories that every that there are magical creatures. Um, they think it's all made up. But then when an earthquake hits and their father is injured, they end up in this world called Tierra de los Olvidados, where they discovered that all the creatures their dad has ever spoken about are real. And now they have to travel across this magical um, place that doesn't want them there right um and find the queen who will do anything to get rid of them um to convince her that they are worth saving and sending back home and it was oh it was so heartwarming Thank such you. a fun adventure I, I was loving it so much I, and fantasy is so my jam anyways and so I was loving going to this other world that I you know I didn't know the culture of Colombia and so this was so fun are these stories that you grew up with or is this something you had to go and research so a little bit of both um I did grow up hearing the stories my uncle was an avid storyteller and when I would go to the farms in Colombia in the summers he would tell us about a lot of the creatures there Right. Um, like the Madre Monte, the, El the Duendes, which are like trickster elves. Um, and then there was some that my cousins liked to scare me with, like the Mano Peluda, which was kind of like the boogeyman that hid under the bed, right. um, just waiting to grab you. Um, and so all of I, I was familiar on a superficial level with all of these okay. stories because they're what I grew up hearing. Okay. Um, but when I set out to write that story, I did have to do a lot of research um, because there was a lot more to the stories than what I was familiar with. 
Okay, so I interviewed Julian Randall some time ago about Pilar Ramirez. And one of the things that we talked about was um, for that culture, like the burritas, that's really a religion for some people. Is this for some parts of the culture that this is still very real for them? Or is this more like Greek mythology that there's not really anybody actively recognizing it as truth? So I think... For most of the legends, um, they are still very much, um, they, they are kind of like the Greek mythology. It's okay. just, you know, we talk about them, but there are still some, the the connection with nature okay. um, and some of the, the cultures within Colombia um, are very much real. Okay. And so the the legends like the Madre Monte are a mix of imagination, but also belief. Of, and that importance, that importance yes. to the land and respect and yes. treating the land the way it should be. As it's a living, breathing okay. being. Excellent. And so, like, the stories help remember the reason of taking care okay. of right. the earth. Okay, excellent, excellent. So then um, when you're creating this story about Valentina and she really is just like no you know I'm not having any of this tell me about getting yourself like world building like putting yourself in uh, Tierra de Olvidados Tierra de los Olvidados okay. so the, the um Tierra de los Olvidados which is actually a spin on a popular Colombian song called Tierra del Olvido by Carlos okay. Vives great um it it really tops it mirrors the real Colombia. And so when I was world built, when I was working on this world and what this world looked like, um, I really wanted to pay homage to the natural landscape of Colombia, the diversity of landscape, the flora, the fauna, also the, the part that is endangered because there's a lot of, due to the deforestation, um, there's a lot of animals that are at risk of being endangered or are currently endangered. And so I wanted to, in a way, pay homage to that. And that went, um, that was a very big uh, role that, that played a very big role in the world building when I was describing the world. Okay, excellent, excellent. So um, let's see, I wanted to figure out how to talk about it without giving away the story because I love so much how it all comes together at the end. So is there anybody else that um, you have reflected in the story that you've, you feel like yourself is kind of in the main character, right? Of loving the art. Do you base any of the other characters or personalities on others like in your life or other parts of yourself? I definitely draw names from my family members. I have a very large family. I have 15 aunts and uncles and about 52 cousins, give or take. That so, is awesome. Uh, that is, I, I have a lot of names to draw from. And definitely there are some characteristics. So Doña Ruth is a capybara okay. and she, her characteristics and her description and her name are actually drawn from my aunt who is very sweet, but when you first meet her, she might seem quite severe. Okay. Um, and a, the, a lot of the, just definitely the names, but yeah, in the, in the, um, the dad is, is, um, loosely based on my uncle who was the storyteller. The storyteller. Excellent. Um, Cause yeah. Uh, and the dad is so into the stories in this. Yeah. Yes, he is. And in a, in a, original draft I had him actually diving into a story but that was edited out but oh. um it is I, I want to say that a little bit of each of my family members and the people that I know my friends I do sort of make their way into it but for this one especially it was it was bringing in everything that I love about Colombia including family that okay excellent so that that's so important, that family and that love. And so you weave that into here. And that's, you know, that's what drives the adventure is all about family. And then also, um, I feel like Valentina has a lot of self-discovery of awareness of because the creatures do not trust the humans in the story, right? And so there's understanding why somebody wouldn't trust somebody and um, also reflecting on that herself. But um, she's so family driven and discovers more about her relationship with her brother through this adventure. And it's just it's a fun, fantastical adventure. I loved it so much. Uh, do you okay. have anything else that you think you'll revisit with this fantastical world? 
Oh, there's so much that um, I've learned since um, new discoveries that are happening that I would love to one day be able to explore more. There have been some cave paintings that have been discovered. And so there's a lot more of the world I would love to one day revisit. That's cool. Excellent. So then you come and make this very realistic fiction next. And again, tied to Columbia roots with Grow Up Luchi Zapata. So tell me about creating this story. So I, I never thought that I would be able to write contemporary realistic fiction just because I was always in the fantasy world. Most of what I had written novel length has been, had been um, fantasy. But around the time that my son started middle school mm -hmm. um, and was going through all of his you know, what's it going to be like and excited, but not, but nervous. Um, and then just walking through with him through those first months of sixth grade, I couldn't help but start reflecting on my own middle school experience and just kind of comparing the two, um, comparing our relationship to our culture and what that looks like, first gen versus second gen American and all of these things just kept going through me. And suddenly Lucci popped up, very voicey, very in my face, very, I need you to write me down right now. And so I just grabbed, a, you know, started drafting the first things that came, th that first line right. has been there from the beginning. Yay! That was just the opening. I, I wrote that. that first page. And then I didn't know what the story was going. I was like, what story? What? Lucci, where are you taking me? Right. And so then I started plotting because I am more of a plotter by nature. And so okay. I started kind of plotting it out. I didn't know what I was doing. And said, I, I know adventure. I know fantasy. What does this look like in a realistic, quieter type of novel? And so there right. was a lot of reading mentor texts and just trying to wrap my brain around what this would look like in the middle of revising. Right. Dina. <laughs> Okay. Okay, cool. So again, family driven, but so much more about friendship in yes. this. One. And again, some self-discovery of reflection on Lucci. And so um, I think this is so great because so many people go through friend changes around the middle school, junior high years. Right. And um, actually um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Michelle Accard, she talks about when she writes about parenting for teens that this is not necessarily a bad thing to have friendships change in middle school. Like parents get so concerned about this. And I'm, I'm sure, especially because Lucci is very concerned about what's going on, right. About her friendships, but um, that it's just a normal part of life for growing yeah. up and changing and um, friends change and, too. And even as adults, we yes. go through friendship breakups right. that are painful and we need to learn to, and it's hard. It's it's right. hard navigating that, those changes. And often, maybe sometimes they're for the better. But. Right, right. Um, sometimes definitely, you know, sad and hard yeah. and you might wish it not happened, but right. It could be what's Hindsight. best, right? Yeah, yeah. In the moment, nobody wants to go through it. And uh, I'm always like thinking, Ah, junior high was like the worst ever like just the high school was great <laughs> elementary school was so fun but then those middle years they're hard transition is so hard so I love a book like this that it's like facing these realities of you know at first the book starts out with excitement the Lucy's so excited about starting school with her friend who she hasn't gone to school with before and she's got these two buddies um tell me names I'm sorry Cam Cammy and Matthew Cammy and Mateo. So she's got the two buddies and Cammy's also Colombian. And so comes back from Colombia. And um, I like, I like this that you approached. Um, and can you tell me more about doing this of, um, do you think a lot of people do struggle with different cultural ties? Because Lucci's like, kind of like almost annoyed, right? With um, her family's Colombian. Um, yes. Colombian-ness. Yes, Colombian-ness. <laughs> Yeah, so a hundred percent. And one of the things that I didn't realize I was doing until much later that I realized, of course, um, was exploring the different ways we connect with our culture, with our ancestral home. 
And so in writing Lucci and Cami, both Colombian Americans, but both having very distinct connections to Colombia, um, I was almost exploring it within my own families, just seeing that diversity and seeing the diversity in the diaspora and not just for Colombians, but for anyone who is living in the diaspora, how we carry our ancestral home is a little different. It's very unique and personal. Uh, and it's something that I, I guess I wanted Lucci to realize in her journey and that there is no one right way of experiencing cultures. And my son, for example, um, we are a Colombian, German, Chilean, American household. Wow. So, yes. Um, and the way he experiences or connects to each of those parts varies. Um, for Colombia, it's a lot in the music. He's and he is a musician, so he connects a lot with that with with the salsa, cumbia, vallenato, the, the music. But then also in part the food. Um, yes. Same thing with Chile. It's the food. It's the yes. and then soccer. I mean, soccer for us is huge. You know. Right. And, um hey so i have a quick question yes is soccer still so huge for adults to play um yes the culture? it is because have you have you noticed that with so many americans they put all their kid um i don't know what am i trying to say Cauc white caucasian americans that put all their kids in soccer and then they're into as adults basketball and football and i'm like hey where does soccer go I don't think that soccer is as big in the U S right. and maybe that's why um, it, Miami is, is we have a very large Latinx population and yes. Caribbean population. And so soccer is pretty big yeah, down here. Hold on to it more. Yeah. That's cool. Cause yeah, like in so many other countries in Europe and in South America and so yeah. many places, but not even in the United States, like, like we stop everything. We they stop like everything. forget about the, as children, <laughs> they played it all the time. And then, you know, there's less and less yeah. to, I don't know. It just, so that's great. So the family, it's all about, you know, okay. So the sport we've got, she's into art and her friends really into the academics, the Columbia, the culture, the Columbia, yes. the different generations. Yes. And um, yeah, that diaspora of. I said it's an exploration of the difference in the diaspora um, and how we carry the con our, our culture, our ancestral home. Um, it varies. Um, Spanish for me was that was my first language. Uh, so I'm more connected. And even as with it being my first language that I went through a rebellious period where I didn't want to speak it apparently, mm -hmm. according to my cousin. Um, and it was more of I, when Lucci, there's a point that Lucci says, well, I'm from Miami. That's where I was born. Okay, yeah. um, I, I distinctly remember a point where I, w I am born. I was born in New York. I was born here in right. the U S but I grew up with such deep roots in Colombia that um, I, I felt Colombian, but then there was that, well, but I was born here. Right. Yeah. The American. Almost like this internal battle of yes. where am I? Yes. And learning to take ownership of both heritages, you yeah. know, who you are in that mix. That's, that's great. Like, so um, I do that a lot with names that people should own their names. Right. Um, so um, my name is Karen, and that is not a compliment these days. Uh -huh. So I, I like to use mine as an example that I tell people, you know, just own it. Just right. like, I mean, don't own being a Karen. <laughs> like take, like, so I look up what it means and the word means pure, you know. And so I, I find ways to own it and find reasons I love it. And I love my last name reader. And that's what I'm all about is books. And so I talk about, you know, taking on for who you are. And I feel like that's so much with your books, maybe not so much with the name, but more with the culture. I love that you say that um, because for the longest time growing up, being Colombian was not looked favorably up. I mean, right. people, what they associate with or say associated with Colombia was drugs and violence, and violence. And the car bombs and absolutely we experienced that. Um, I personally didn't, but my cousins did. I had a cousin who was injured during a ca car bomb on a regular night out. Um, it was a reality um, for those living in Colombia and being displaced, um, which is actually a little bit um, what I covered with the first book. 
Right. But Colombia is so much more than its past. It's so much right. more than those moments. Um, and I, I think that if we focus only on one area, then it's an incomplete picture. It becomes a stereotype. It becomes, right. um, it doesn't pay honor to the fullness of an experience. So that was definitely something that I was mindful in providing another look at what Colombia and being Colombian is. Yes. And I love that perspective that you bring because I was guilty of the same, like of uh, seeing the stereotype. Yeah. And um, when my friends went to Colombia um, recently, the, the whole family went and um, they're complete you know, gringos. And so I initially, I was like, oh, wow, are you, are you concerned about this at all? And he's like, well, with work, I know where to go and everything. And, you know, that's not what the focus is going to be on. We'll be safe, but we're excited to go and explore this culture. And he teaches Spanish at the university. And so, and he studies Spanish literature. And so it's just, you know, that's when I realized I was like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have let that be my first thought. And so it was so fun talking to them and seeing their pictures. And then not long after that, I discovered your books. And so I was, I was really upset with myself. Like I was like, oh, look at me being a Karen, right? You know, yeah. so. I get it. I, and I do get it because it was such a, a terrifying period. Right. Right. So bringing the stereotype. I love that. I love how much you have family. Um, you bring the sports in, bring the very real reality of kids entering middle school and changing. And um, I love, I love the values in it too. Like the really having to face up and own your decisions. And so I love She's so real, Luchi, because she makes mistakes, right? And then she she eventually owns them. And so I, I found that to be so powerful. And not everybody in the school owns their mistakes. And so I found that real too. And it's a hard it's an it's a hard lesson to learn, I think, because the initial reaction is to not be wrong, not fail. Right? And it's in that failure that we learn and we grow. And so I wanted, um, there was a, there's a point where mom is talking to her and, you know, she makes it a point that everyone fails. Everyone yes. makes mistakes, even adults, yes. adults mess it up all the time. Um, but it's how we react to that. Yes. That matters. So actually that Michelle Eckhart I mentioned, um, her book, Eight Setbacks That Can Make You a Success is about failure. And that it's important for teens to have failure or they won't grow. As um, parents, so often we want to protect from failure or we want to not fail. Who wants to fail? That's not fun. Nobody likes it. It's not fun. <laughs> but it's such a valuable experience and the growth won't happen if there's not failure. Mm. We don't recognize it. So I think I think that's great. And I, I feel like even Valentina goes through a little bit of that, kind of like what I was talking about, her realization of um, or like the stereotype, the way that they were judging her for being human. And the way she was judging them. Yes. Because that was that yes. double judging, you know, and then she's yes. like, has this moment of, wait, what am I doing? Right. Right. And so love it. Uh, what, what are in the works? Do you have enough? Cause I know with an author, it's often like so far out what's coming. It next. Is. So I have a short story in an anthology. Great that is releasing in January, actually. Um, and it's about a girl who is navigating grief and fibromyalgia, which is actually loosely based on my own journey with, with fibromyalgia. Oh. And um, I'm excited for that. It's in verse. Uh, cool. So it'll be my first story in verse. Um, I've published poetry before, but it's my first um, story in verse that is it this will... same middle grade audience or is this it is actually young adults young adult okay it's so fun adult. so, so I, you're gonna I hit all the levels I don't like being boxed in right area apparently um I remember uh Jane Yolen once saying that she's like write everything and I'm like that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do it excellent so it. tell me about how many picture books have you done why don't you tell me about one of those 
So I have currently four, three, four, three picture books and one board book. Cool. And I have another picture book releasing in 2026, but that hasn't been announced yet. Okay, cool, cool. So I am going to include in our description uh, below the video, there'll be a description and we, um, I'll have you send me the names of the different books. Okay. So that we can get those explored that, that you really have gone the whole spectrum of children's literature from board books to picture books, to middle grade, to yeah, young adults. So, um, I think all you have left to do is the early readers. Um, I heard library yeah. to call them the everybody books because nobody wants to be labeled as an emergent reader. <laughs> So there you go. That, that it's going to be your next yeah. one. And then I think you'll have done a yeah. graphic novel. <laughs> graphic novel, I would love to do. That'd be fun. One day. That'd be cool. All right. So, Alexandra, can you tell me a favorite children's book you have besides one of your own brilliant books? Absolutely. So, this one just released. All right. Excellent. And it is called I Am La Chiva. La Chiva. Tell um, me what La Chiva means. So, La Chiva. Chiva in Spanish means goat. Oh. And so in Colombia, we have these really fun, colorful buses. Uh, yes. They used to be used to transport goods, um, people from throughout the towns. Um, and it's kind of evolved with the with transportation, you know, changing. So they have become more of an iconic cultural heritage. Um, although I believe in some places they still also um, function in their original role. Okay. So it's written by Carol Hernandez, who is also Colombian and illustrated by Lorena Alvarez Gomez, who is also Colombian. Cool. And I absolutely love the illustrations. I don't know if you can see the illustrations. So beautiful and colorful. It is absolutely beautiful. And it, it just taps into so many little parts of Colombia. And I grew up, uh, when, when I would go to visit, uh, there I've written chivas, I've seen them, and they're just so awesome. I love color. I love art. And so right. that colorfulness, the, um, I've always just loved them. And so when I first saw this, I was like, I need to, I need this book. Yes. And we've connected um, in person too. And I just was at, oh, her, at her launch and it was just so wonderful. Oh. Um, but I love that book. It is absolutely beautiful and um, everyone should check it out. And that's so much of what Columbia is about, right? Is the art and the colors, these beautiful, yeah. bright, vibrant colors. So, excellent. yes. Well, I love it so much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And I can't wait to see what's Thank coming you. out next. I'm going to have to go and also check out some of those picture books. Thank you so much, Karen. This was awesome. This was a wonderful conversation. <laughs>